Well, time to talk to the Finance Minister and Coalition campaign spokesman Simon Birmingham. To take us there, here was Anthony Albanese on Sky this morning discussing Labor's new shared equity housing policy. It is personal because I think the great Australian dream of owning your own home is we're in danger of being out of reach for a generation. And we need to look at ways constructively in which we can assist that, as well as dealing with homelessness, dealing with public housing, dealing with affordable housing. We need a, a whole of government approach. Senator Birmingham, welcome to the program. Hello, David. Good to be with you. Do you think this sort of shared equity scheme for housing is a good idea? David, I think this again paints to the choice that's on offer at this election. Uh, the Coalition has implemented policies that we are now expanding in relation to supporting first homeowners into the market. Our policies are proven to be working. Uh, we saw 160,000 new first homeowners into the Australian market last year. That's up from a five year average of around 100,000. Uh, it's showing strong growth in relation to first home ownership. And so we are expanding our first home owners guarantee to 50,000 places per annum versus a Labor policy that is of 10,000. Our policy is about ensuring that, as, that Australians get to own their own home. Labor's policy is about the government owning parts of your home with you. So, so you think that's a bad is, idea? David, I think our policy is working. It's helping now really lift the rates of first home ownership. Uh, it's delivering outcomes for Australians. And importantly, you get to own your own home you don't have Mr Albanese at the kitchen table with you, owning part of your home with you. I guess the, the argument, though, is this gives a lot more help to those smaller number of people, 10,000 a year. They can have government help for up to 30 or even 40 per cent of their housing cost. We've carefully calibrated our policy and we've made sure that it does provide additional help, for example, to single parents who we're supporting into the housing market in Australia with just a 2 per cent deposit. But crucially, they've got to still be able to meet all of the financial aspects of having a loan. And that's about ensuring there's responsibility. No, I, I know your policy. I'm just saying, well. do you think this is a bad idea, though, what Labor's suggested here? Well, I think our policy is a better idea. Uh, and I think when Australians look at the choice of uh, getting that support for more Australians than Labor is offering, to be able to own all of their own home, rather than fewer numbers of Australians to only own part of their own home, the Coalition's policy is a far more compelling argument. Well, the reason I ask is because a number of states have similar schemes in place. Uh, New South Wales, the, the Premier there, Dominic Perrottet, is working on one at the moment. And in fact, if you go back to 2008 when you were in opposition, Scott Morrison advocated investing half a billion dollars in a shared equity scheme. He said, and I quote, this would allow 5,000 Australian households to access shared equity mortgages and instantly cut their mortgage, their monthly mortgage repayments by up to 30% or more. Was it a good idea back then? Well, we've done a lot of work on our policy since 2008, David, and we're implementing policy, a policy, shared, as I say, that is, uh, that, is, uh, that is working uh, as a policy, and it's a policy... I, I, that I know your policy. I know, you, I know you believe in your policy, but was this yeah, shared we, equity? We do believe in our policy. No, I'm asking right. about the shared equity And it's equity working, idea. too. The shared equity idea that Scott Morrison advocated back then. David, we think our policy is a preferable approach. Now, yes, you're right, some of the states and territories have different schemes and there's nothing wrong with those schemes operating. I'm not sure why, then, a federal government would need to duplicate schemes that states and territories are running. It seems like that would be another element of Labor waste in that sense, to run a duplication of something states and territories are doing. Even if Scott we think Morrison the approach we have taken, The approach we have taken has been to fix a particular problem in the housing market, and that was the fact that you had to save, of course, for your deposit, taking months and months, years and years, to get that 20% deposit to avoid having uh, to pay mortgage insurance. Uh, that was meaning that people were having to pay rent at the same time as saving. We've managed to break down that problem. It's a policy that's proving to be working. It's got first home ownership rates growing again under the Liberal and National Government. Uh, and that's why we have taken to this election an expansion of that policy to 50,000 places per annum. And so it's a policy, as I say, that's going to provide more Australians, 50,000 versus 10,000, uh, the opportunity to be able to get into the first okay. homeowners market and to own 100% of their home and not share it with a Labor government. All right, let me turn to the more general problem of rising prices. Has inflation now peaked or can it still go higher? David, these are incredibly uncertain global times. So uh, our budget forecasts anticipate that, uh, that yes, we expect to see a stabilisation of those inflation rates and that they come down. 
Uh, however, we shouldn't underestimate the uncertainty that exists around the world. So there inflation still could huge... still go higher, is that what you're saying? Uh, well, David, uh, David, I've pointed to our budget forecast. That is what well, we expect. Well, just on your budget forecast, however, they're, already, should... they're already out, aren't they? Because they forecast inflation for this financial year to be 4.25%. It's already at 5.1%. So the budget's out of date. Well, we're not to the end of this financial year, so obviously uh, those uh, year-end figures, uh, you're talking about the uh, year to the end of the March quarter uh, over the last 12 months. But we'll see, uh, we'll see those when they come through in due Quite course. Quite a drop. The, uh, the reality, David, is that we do face big pressures coming from overseas. You've got virtually an energy crisis happening in Europe at present as a result of Russia's war on Ukraine. That's driven huge shocks to commodity prices and energy prices around the world. You've got big disruptions in terms of supply chains, transport and logistics, uh, aftershocks of COVID that are occurring. Now, these are all real factors that Australia has to deal with. And now we have managed to withstand those better than most. And as government, we could foresee uh, many of these challenges, which is why in the budget we handed down a few weeks back, uh, we had a cost of living package that delivered targeted support to Australian households. But it is also crucially why, David, in that budget, we put the vast majority of bottom line improvements we were seeing in the budget towards having lower deficits going forward, $103 billion of lower deficits, uh, to ensure that we weren't adding to those inflationary pressures in the Australian you, economy. You mentioned that inflation is higher in uh, other countries, which is true. Do you also acknowledge wage growth is higher? It's higher in New Zealand, in Canada, the UK, the US. In fact, wage growth in the US is more than double what it is in Australia. Why are wages so sluggish here? No, oh, and, and David, inflation rates are significantly higher in the US than they are in Australia as, uh, as well. Uh, and it does depend very much on how you read the different measures of, uh, of wages growth. And, uh, and Treasury outlined some of that analysis in our budget this year about the fact that we are seeing, uh, and I heard James Campbell talking about this before, we are seeing different areas of wages growth occurring across the Australian economy as people shift mm. between jobs and between roles and, uh, and often uh, are seeing different measures of their earnings occur as a result of that. But of course, you know, our policy is about making sure we keep uh, driving the record jobs growth we've seen in the Australian economy, driving that unemployment rate, which is uh, headed towards a 50-year low, uh, the lowest in our lifetimes, David, uh, and seizing the opportunities from that that will drive further wages growth in the Australian economy, so, uh, as well as creating so more opportunities. The plan to get Australian wages economy. going is to keep doing what you've been doing for the last nine years. Uh, David, uh, our plan is a comprehensive economic plan and it's in stark contrast to the Labor Party. No, uh, we, have, we have outlined uh, clearly plans for, yes, that jobs growth, jobs growth fuelled uh, by lower taxes and tax relief for Australians that continue to be implemented in terms of lower income taxes, support for small businesses and all more, the Australian more of the same, in terms of investment. Saying. It's doing what you've been doing. Uh, David, it's, uh, it, it's a plan that we've outlined in quite a lot of detail uh, compared to what is a policy right, vacuum no on new the ideas. economy There's no new from the Labor Party. There's no new to get wages going, are there? Uh, well, uh, I think if you look at this year's budget, what you saw in terms of small business, a particular focus in relation to investment in technology, a particular focus in relation to investment Well, you're, you're ending the instant you asset saw, you, you saw, and David, we're targeting now, this is the transition from the COVID support era to now the post-recovery and actually driving uh, investment in keeping our economy growing. So those investment in skills and technology uh, align very much with our digital economy strategy and with our modern manufacturing strategy, with our Agriculture 2030 plans. All of those are detailed plans to ensure that Australia's economy keeps outstripping the rest of the world in terms of growth, of our economy, of jobs, and from that, creating the opportunities for Australians. And power, it's a, it's a power, prices, power prices are set to rise. Uh, at the last election, the government set uh, a price target, you called it, to keep uh, wholesale electricity prices below $70 a megawatt hour. In the first three months of the year, the average price was $87 a megawatt hour. What was the point of the price target beyond the cheap headline? Well, David, uh, what we achieved was that, uh, was that in 2019, uh, prices were around... Uh, $89 per megawatt hour. Uh, last year, we drove those wholesale prices down to $67 and per now? megawatt hour. Uh, now, you will get fluctuations, and we were just talking before about the energy market crisis you're seeing in Europe and the impacts that's having right around the world. So it's out of your so once control. Again, well, not everything is within the control of the Australian government in a global so market environment. However, 
However, David, um, there are things that are within your control. And if you look at what energy market analysts have said about, for example, Labor's plans to gold plate electricity transmission, they're forecast to add around $560 to household bills. Based on what modelling? Based on what modelling, Minister? Ba based on modelling by, uh, from, uh, from uh, government analysis, but also backed up by government analysis. From, Can well, we see that backed analysis? Up by commentary. So by data. Treasury, is it? No, no. Energy market analysts as well. Energy such market as Frontier analysis. Economics have, uh, have been very clear in terms of their views. So you said there's government gold analysis. Plating what will modeling? add costs. Energy market analysts have been very clear. Is it government modelling or private sector plating. modelling? David, we've undertaken analysis, but you've also got the commentary of those energy market analysts indicating that Labor's policy will add to those transmission costs. Can you produce that model for we us have, to have a look what at? We have, what we have seen, David, in terms of the lived experience of the last couple of years is household power prices go down by 8% Until now. Uh, across, uh, across Australia under this government's policies compared with what have been significant growth in energy prices previously. OK, We've the, done the that Prime by Minister... The number of energy market reforms. The Prime Minister says Labor's climate plans announced to a sneaky carbon tax. Uh, the Business Council of Australia disagrees. Is it a sneaky carbon tax? Well, David, uh, if you look at the detail of Labor's policy, uh, what they've said is they will reset uh, the benchmark uh, and they will reduce uh, the benchmark in relation to how the safeguards mechanism works. Now, apparently, Labor members themselves haven't read that carefully because you had their members around the Hunter uh, say one thing, that they didn't think that there would be any change to, uh, to the impact of that on mining operations in Australia. And then you had Chris Bowen say there definitely would be. That's true. And then you had Richard Miles say that? he didn't have a clue. Is it, my question was, is it a sneaky carbon tax? Uh, well, uh, it, is, uh, it is in the sense that it's buried uh, well and truly in terms of a bit of vague soft language that appears to be causing confusion within Labor's own ranks uh, that would, in the way in which it's described, apply uh, pressures and costs uh, that would ultimately be passed through, so costs supplied by government... this is a carbon tax? David, it is, uh, it is a cost pressure on those... Is it businesses. a carbon tax? Uh, well, it has the same sorts of effects in terms of applying cost pressures on those Australian businesses and their operations. So what's the safeguards mechanism over the last financial year done? What have big emitters been required to pay under your safeguards mechanism? Well, our safeguards me mechanism operates to ensure that businesses operate at an emissions intensity level um, that, uh, that doesn't grow over time. Well, they, they can expand their operations. Well, they don't have to pay, David. That's, uh, that's the point, as long as they well, operate under that emissions intensity According to the Clean Energy Regulator, 14 level, companies however, have been required to source and surrender carbon credits. That's cost yeah. an estimated $15 million. Sorry. Sorry. I, and, David, I said they don't have to pay as long as they operate under that emissions intensity level. Now, Labor's proposing to change that level and to reduce it. Now, we, we talked about Labor. What's your, so what have yeah. they paid under your... So, I mean, if it's, if it's not so sneaky under the government, what have they had to pay? But, uh, but David, there is a fundamental change in the way the safeguards mechanism works. I appreciate that. Work I'm just asking us. what's happened over the last financial year under your, so, so, under your safeguards so, mechanism over so the David, last financial our, year. David, our policy's been there for, uh, for yeah. and what, a period what it, of time. If it's not so sneaky, and can you tell us? What have, what have businesses had to pay? Uh, well, David, I don't have the figure to hand... However, in our policy, the emissions it's intensity sneaky, level... It? No, it's, uh, it's not. Uh, because is the emissions it $15 intensity million? level remains constant. So, as I don't have the figures to hand, David, but the emissions intensity level remains constant under our policy. Right. Labor and their policy have said they will reset that level, but they're not telling you what they'll reset it to. And they've said they will reduce it, but they're not saying how much they'll reduce it by. Hmm. So, again, that's the choice at this election and the contrast between the two different policies. Now, I take your point, but, but you can't tell us what business has been paying over the last financial year under your own... As I, as I say, David, I don't have that figure there, okay. but Labor are the ones proposing a change to this. The government isn't proposing a change to this, yet they won't provide the details of what that change will be. <laughs> you can't and they can't the explain it what's themselves. Right now. Let's turn to the Solomon Islands. Is China interfering in the Australian election? We've known that foreign interference is a real risk in, uh, in the Australian is electoral landscape and in Australian politics generally. It's why we, as a government, put in place foreign interference laws as part of a range of different protections that we've applied to, uh, to Australia in response mm. to the more aggressive and assertive chance, stance of China and, uh, and indeed other risks over recent years. And so is it happening in this election? 
Uh, well, David, that would be a matter for, uh, for our intelligence analysts and others uh, who would be no doubt monitoring these matters very closely. Well, your colleague uh, Karen reason... Andrews reckons the, this uh, announcement of the Solomon Island Security Pact was a deliberate attempt at interference in the Australian election. Well, we've, seen, uh, we've seen enormous hostility in the commentary from, uh, from elements of the Chinese Communist Party and their mouthpiece organs in Beijing towards this government. Uh, now, we want to fight this election on the policies as they matter to Australia, the competing economic plans between our government uh, and Anthony Albanese and the risks that he would right. pose. Uh, in terms of foreign interference, uh, we trust that our agencies and those who seek to protect Australia's democratic institutions are best placed to do so. And under our government, we've put in place enhanced laws, structures and funding to all of those sorts of agencies to enable them to best do so. And, and just a final one, the Prime Minister uh, has suggested if uh, a military base were to be built by China in the Solomon Islands, that would be a red line. What does that mean? Well, the Prime Minister was acknowledging the statements that the United States had made there as well in, uh, in relation to the unacceptability of that outcome uh, and, uh, and that that may necessitate uh, other basing or operational decisions that the US or other partner countries might need to make into, uh, into the future. Now, uh, again, uh, we will continue to work as we have with Prime Minister Songavari and others across the Pacific and we acknowledge his public statements and ongoing commitments that there will not be foreign military bases established in the Solomon Islands uh, and we'll continue to provide the record levels of development assistance of military and security assistance, of climate assistance and of diplomatic engagement across the Pacific Island countries to make sure those commitments are held to. Simon Birmingham, thanks very much for joining us today. Thanks, David. My pleasure.